The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, it's Floyd's first ever hunting trip with his wife, Debbie, a lifelong deer hunter and gun enthusiast. But even the most experienced hunters can't always prevent a tragic turn of events. Oh, God, my husband. It looks like a terrible accident until a keen-eyed investigator discovers things are not as they appear to be. State police, stand down! Get out of here, lawman. But with hunting season in full swing and more guns in the woods than you can count. You take me for some slack-jawed idiot? Will he be able to track down the killer? Or will someone get away with the perfect crime? It's deer season in western Arkansas, and hunters from all over the state are looking to bag a high point buck before winter sets in. Help! Somebody help! Somebody! Please! Hang on there, Missy! Zeke's on his way! You've got to get help! Please! Hurry! Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm faster than grease lightning there. Zeke heads to the nearest park ranger station five miles away. There's a lot of hunters in my family, and I can tell you that out in the woods, there's always a risk that the wrong animal is going to get shot. When I was at the Bureau, we learned that when it comes to guns, all the safety precautions in the world can't stop a stray bullet once it's on its way. And this looks like one of those sad situations. My husband, Floyd. This was our first hunting trip together. We had never even been hunting before. This is terrible. Honey, I'm home. Hi, baby. I was just polishing my hand cannon, sweetie. Grandpappy's six-point buck. Floyd and Debbie have been married for a year. Debbie works as a kindergarten teacher. And Floyd makes a good living as an actuary in the insurance industry. I'm telling you, you ought to come hunting with your old lady someday. I don't know, honey. You know I'm not one for the great outdoors. Well, you think it over, sweet pea. Maybe someday you'll have a trophy on the wall. Honey, I have a trophy now. Happy birthday, baby. Oh, my God, you got this for me. I did. It's Debbie's second serious relationship. Before she met Floyd, she lived with a woman named Carol, a pastry chef who specializes in fancy wedding cakes. They bonded over a shared love of hunting and camping and would take frequent trips into the wilderness. The opening week of deer season was the highlight of their year. But it doesn't take long for Debbie to grow restless. She thinks she deserves more out of life than teaching little kids their ABCs. She knows that staying with a pastry chef is a dead end if she wants to live the good life. So Debbie starts looking for some company with more cash in the bank. I can't live like this anymore. What, you thought I'd never smell the gum powder? That's just like you would But Carol finds out Debbie's been looking for a sugar mama. Oh, I'll do what I want. I'm not believe you. Back. You know this what? so like I'm you. Out of here. And sends her packing. Get out of my way. You'd hope Debbie has learned her lesson and maybe stopped seeing people as a means to an end. But from where I'm standing, Debbie's what you'd call a narcissist. 
That's the short way of saying she thinks she's superior and entitled to whatever she wants, no matter what. So getting the boot from her girlfriend only makes Debbie more determined to get a sugar mama or a sugar daddy. One night, Debbie sizes up Floyd, who's just moved from New England to take a position at a blue chip firm. It's his job to calculate insurance premiums. Not the most exciting line of work, but hey, it pays well. Now, Floyd is one of those reserved guys they used to call a confirmed bachelor. You know the type. No wife, doesn't date, keeps to himself, avoids talking about his job because it puts people to sleep. But to Debbie, he's the perfect mark. He's got money, and guys like him are desperate. Let's just say easily smitten. After a whirlwind romance, Floyd and Debbie tie the knot. And they quickly settle into a harmonious routine. But it's not even my birthday. Who cares, honey? I know how much you love sparkly things. It's got bling on it. I'm going to show this off tonight at the gun range. You want to come back? Love to, but tonight's book club with the guys. Well, OK. One day, you're going to see what a great shot your gal is, especially dolled up like this. Don't read too hard now. It's a year into their marriage, and Debbie is becoming bored with domestic life. Floydy, I think I need a 9 millimeter. Another one? Yeah, one of the ones that comes in pink. Well, OK, honey. My card's on the table. Take the Beamer if you want, too. And Floyd is more interested in making money than having fun with it. So Debbie tries to spice things up between them. You know what, baby? I have an idea. Why don't you and me go hunting? I haven't been out to the woods since we've been married, and it's deer season real soon. What do you say? It'll be exciting. You've never been hunting before. Hmm. OK, honey. If it'll make you happy, let's go. The state police are called in to conduct a routine autopsy on Floyd. They learn he was shot in the head with a Remington 7mm, a popular make of bullet. And they're working on the assumption it's an accident until they make an unexpected discovery. What in the Sam Hill? After extracting the fatal bullet from Floyd's head, they notice on Floyd's shoulder there's a second wound, a distinctive graze that could only have been caused by another bullet, almost certainly a 7mm round, like the one that killed him. One to the head from a rifle round, OK. Some hunter must have mistaken Floyd for a deer. It can be pretty hard to see clearly out in the bush, even with those orange vests. But that graze wound, it means that someone took a first shot at Floyd and missed, and then got him on the second try. It was open season on the guy. So this ain't no hunting accident, folks. This is a homicide. Now that Floyd's death has been ruled a homicide, the first person state investigator Lieutenant Barnabas wants to question is his wife, Debbie. Murdered? My little Floydie? I can't believe it. You know if anyone want to put the hurt on your husband, ma'am? He have any enemies? Maybe someone from that office of his. They ain't the hunting type if you catch my meaning. OK, looky here. I'm collecting evidence from everyone that was in the area. I'm going to need your jacket, your clothes, your bullets, and your guns. It's common knowledge in a murder investigation like this. The spouse is always your first person of interest. But our lieutenant has no reason to detain Debbie. And there were plenty of other people in the bush that day. It's, it's a big chunk of nature. So before he can put the screws to Debbie, he has to check out the crime scene for himself and figure out who else was in them Nar woods. Uh, 
Mighty fine day for looking for evidence. To prove Floyd was shot at twice, Barnabas needs to find the missing bullet that caused the graze wound on Floyd's shoulder. Working a crime scene in, say, someone's apartment is one thing. But imagine now when your crime scene is a square acre of trees, wild animals, and poison ivy. Good luck dusting for prints. And finding a spent round out there, you'd think it makes finding a needle in a haystack hassle-free. But our lieutenant's a hunting man himself, and he knows exactly what to look for. Because bullets can leave their own kind of fingerprints. I got something here for ballistics. The slug is compressed from the impact into the tree, but Lieutenant Barnabas recognizes it as a seven millimeter bullet. Now that's the same caliber that took out Floyd. And let me tell you, a seven millimeter like this is a lot of bullet. Not too many hunters use it. I mean, you want something left of your animal, but even so, anyone could have fired that round. So our Lieutenant now has to run a ballistics test to see if it came from the same gun used to shoot poor old Floyd. Because there are only so many hunters in the vicinity, narrowing down where the shot came from could narrow down his suspect pool. State police, stand down! Get out of here, lawman. Leave me be. Just take her easy, ma'am. Don't get your britches in a bunch. Drop your weapon, or you'll be having a short conversation with my girlfriend, Peggy Peacemaker here. Go on. Good girl. I'm investigating the shooting of a man who was camped about a mile yonder with his wife. Oh, is he OK? <laughs> Does he look OK to you, ma'am? And this here's a picture of his wife. I found it in his wallet. Wait a minute. That's Debbie. Are you saying you know this woman? I could say I knew Debbie. At least I used to. Sounds like she did you wrong. That's putting it kindly. Carol fills Lieutenant Barnabas in on her past relationship with Debbie. She says she's heard about Floyd, but had never met him and she claims she's had no contact with Debbie at all since the breakup. Makes sense they'd be in the air. Well, that's one hell of a coincidence. Carol's clearly still holding a grudge against her ex, and she's camped out less than a mile from where Debbie's new husband got shot. That's the kind of thing we pay attention to. Carol explains she isn't surprised Debbie was nearby. They'd always come to this area to hunt together during the opening week of deer season. Our lieutenant might not have himself an out-and-out -out suspect, but a person of interest, yes, sir. I mean, I'd be pretty sore, too, if my gal tried cheating on me and then, when that didn't work out, got married to a guy on Easy Street. So motive, check. She's also been camped out less than a mile from where Floyd got shot. Opportunity, check. And that pea shooter she's waving around, well, that could well be the murder weapon. Serious hunter like yourself? Only have one rifle? My only other one. Hmm. But when Lieutenant Barnabas inspects Carol's rifle, he realizes right away that this make of gun doesn't take seven millimeter rounds. It can't be the murder weapon. Mind if I have a little look-see in the tent? All right. Well, now. What do we have here? Carol explains that her spare rifle was a Remington that was too powerful for some smaller deer. So she just had it as a backup. And she claims that two days ago, the day before Floyd got shot, someone stole the Remington and some bullets. And those were seven millimeter. Where were you the day Floyd got shot? In the ranger station reporting theft. Wasn't even in the area. Even if our survivalist sister had both motive and opportunity in spades, she didn't pull the trigger. Looks like it's back to square one for our lieutenant. He knows there's a stolen gun out there and a victim with no apparent enemies. And to me, that brings up a very scary possibility. There could be a thrill killer on the loose waiting to strike again.
Hoping to narrow down the suspect pool, Lieutenant Barnabas checks the campsite booking records for the season. He finds that Debbie had a site booked on the day of the murder under Floyd's corporate credit card, which is potentially illegal. Lieutenant Barnabas decides it's time to have a closer look at our bereaved widow, and for three weeks, surveils Debbie. Suspects on her third bourbon sour. He learns that not only has she sold off Floyd's house, She's quit her teaching job and is spending her days and nights partying off the property sale. It's true, we all grieve in our own way. As an investigator, I've seen some pretty unexpected responses to losing a spouse to murder. But I also know that there are telltale signs of relief when your husband or wife suddenly goes to the happy hunting grounds. Suspicious signs. And Debbie, well, she doesn't seem exactly torn up that Floyd's first deer hunt was also his last. The disrespect of it all. But it still doesn't make sense for Debbie to whack the guy who paid to keep her in clothes and diamonds. Or does it? Sole beneficiary, you say? Bugging you for the payout before my case is even closed? Well, how about that? Thank you kindly, partner. Lieutenant Barnabas learns that Floyd had not one, but two insurance policies, amounting to a couple million. And Debbie is pushing to cash them in. Now that's what I reckon to be a motive. But there's no proof Debbie had anything to do with Floyd's murder. It's all circumstantial. To build a case against Debbie, Lieutenant Barnabas needs physical evidence. But when the forensic report comes in, the ballistics aren't a match for Debbie's rifle. But then, something catches his eye. The forensic report noted that the mud on Debbie's hunting jacket is not native to this region of Arkansas. It's a type of red clay that's brought in to reinforce man-made drinking holes frequented by the deer herds. Remember how tough an outdoor crime scene can be? Well, to help us out here, we use newfangled, cutting-edge kind of analysis we call forensic geology. Basically, you use the terrain itself as a source of evidence, and then the deep woods you get a lot of terrain. Using the forensic report's insight into the unique red clay, Lieutenant Barnabas again follows the bullet's trajectory, this time looking for signs of the telltale clay. Sure enough, there's a direct trajectory from the drinking hole to the bullet hole. It's all pretty cool forensic science. That red clay is used in very specific places in this area. So the fact that it's all over Debbie's jacket places her right at the scene. But unfortunately, it misses the mark as far as proof goes. Anyone could have fired at Floyd from that spot. But the good news is, it is enough to put a little heat on our grieving widow, Debbie. Well, thank you kind of man for coming down today. Now that he has a convincing scenario pointing to Debbie as the shooter, Lieutenant Barnabas brings her back in for questioning. I think you got a little old friend there that likes to hunt in the same parts you do. Name of Carol, ain't it? Sure. We used to come up here together a lot, but I haven't seen her in a while. I got something for you. Now, how's your geology, ma'am? Why don't we go stretch the old legs a little bit, get some fresh air. Come on, now. Take the way, Lieutenant. <laughs> Lieutenant Barnabas takes Debbie to the clearing where Floyd was shot, hoping to gauge her reaction. 
Lieutenant Barnabas knows that sometimes the bad guys don't return to the scene of the crime, so you just gotta take them there yourself. It's a great investigative trick. If your suspect knows that you know what happened, they can get stuck like a deer in the headlights of the law, and that means they start talking, although it might take some persuading. What are we doing here? See that bullet hole here? Great. Just go over up, over there, 100 yards. Walk that way. Next, he takes Debbie to the watering hole, where he thinks the shot that killed Floyd came from. This place looks familiar to you at all? Well, maybe this photograph would jog your noggin. Lieutenant, I have no idea what this is all about. Why are we in the woods? Well, I got me a little itty bitty theory about what happened to your Floyd. Lieutenant Barnabas tells Debbie he thinks she snuck into Carol's campsite at the break of dawn on the day Floyd was killed. She knew her ex-girlfriend would be at her usual camping spot for the opening of deer season and stole her gun to commit the murder. That's ridiculous. Man, you take me for some slack-jawed idiot? I know you done it. You're lying right here with your ex-girlfriend's firearm. Well, that's a pretty wild tale, Lieutenant. And where's your proof? You think you can outsmart the law, Missy? And finally, this here, red clay, is only found at this watering hole. This watering hole's the only one for miles. I might as well add that it's also a fine place to scope out some prey. Okay. Okay, you win. But you gotta understand, you see, Floyd is fixing for a divorce. Debbie tells Lieutenant Barnabas that Floyd was fed up with her extravagant spending. Call your mother and ask her if we can borrow some money. Even a love-struck guy like Floyd has a limit, especially when your whole job is about putting a monetary value on things. He just couldn't keep paying out forever. Sure, at first he hadn't minded. In fact, he liked dolling up his gorgeous wife. But as time went by, he started feeling used. Who wouldn't? And that's when Floyd started talking about separating. With Floyd threatening divorce, Debbie is forced to rethink her prospects. She had to come up with a plan B. Debbie knew that Floyd was her personal goose with the golden eggs. I mean, wasn't that the whole idea in the first place? If they got divorced, she'd have to go back to being a mere kindergarten teacher with champagne tastes on a beer budget. Not to mention having to, and pardon the pun, shell out for all that ammo at the gun range. Just because you can buy bullets at Walmart doesn't make them cheap. But Floyd's life insurance means those golden eggs could be laid from the afterlife, as long as he dies in an accident. So Debbie suggested they go on a hunting trip to patch things up. After stealing Carol's rifle, Debbie picked out the perfect spot to shoot Floyd. You know, even I have to admit it was a good plan as far as first degree murder goes. If for some reason the authorities didn't think it was an accident, Debbie had a ready-made patsy in Carol because Carol's gun could be tied to Floyd's death. Either way, she'd be walking away a wealthy woman. But Debbie hadn't counted on something. Unlike Debbie, hubby Floyd was a total klutz in the woods, and that would literally trip her up. Debbie told Floyd to wait in the clearing while she flushed out the deer from the woods. Shoot, I'm not a deer. Don't shoot. Floyd, 
was a fool. You can't just groom a filly like me and leave her out to pasture. I had to do it. I needed that money. I deserved that money. Thought you had your pretty perfect plan, did you? I did have a perfect plan. If that idiot hadn't have tripped, I wouldn't have missed on the first shot. People would have thought it was an accident. Well, that's about the size of it. Ma'am, you're under arrest. Debbie tells Lieutenant Barnabas where to find the murder weapon, Carol's rifle. The ballistics from the gun and Debbie's confession put her behind bars for life with no chance of parole. It all came down to mud. Well, I'll be damned. Learn something new every day. Crooks the world over dream of committing the perfect crime, but I'm here to tell you there's no such thing. That said, Debbie came pretty close. It was an ideal setting to stage an accident that was actually a murder. It's deer season, bullets are flying everywhere. A ready-made fall gal in the ex-girlfriend, but her own setting gave Debbie away, thanks to some forensic science and a determined lawman. So next time when you're aiming to whack someone, just remember, when you're caught, and we will catch you, you're gonna have to bite the bullet we call hard time. <laughs>